Hey now, welcome back to the Deadology Podcast from Pencil Hill Studio, New Paltz, New York. I'm your host, Howard Weiner. Today is April 30th, 2024, and this is Season 2, Episode 17 of the podcast. We're going to go back to 1970, Miles Davis and the Grateful Dead and the Fillmore West, perfect together. Uh, The Grateful Dead show we're going to look at is from April 12th, and the Miles Davis show is from April 10th. Uh, So Miles opened for the Grateful Dead four consecutive nights, uh, April 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And the reason we're going we're gonna to look at separate nights here is Miles Davis, uh, the, the recording of Davis from these shows is from April 10th. Um, it was released as Black Beauty, uh, a double album. And I, I, when I was doing when I was thinking about this podcast, I was like, hey, why don't I do the Grateful Dead show from April 10th? I don't remember that one too good. And it turns out, I don't remember it because there is no known recording from the April 10th. It's one of those rare lost shows where there's no recording. So I very well couldn't do April 10th. So I chose April 12th, which is in part a famous show because the Dancing in the street f- Streets is included on the Fallout from the Fill Zone uh, release. It's a spectacular Dancing in the Streets. And, and the whole show is, is excellent. So... um we're going to do the April 12th Dead Show, April 10th Miles Show, and I'm sure the the show that Miles played on April 12th was pretty similar to what he did on the 10th. I mean, it's wild improv- improv- improvisation, so it's it's different, but I think he played basically the same set of songs in the same style. So, um, man, what a... What a night that must have been, April 12th, 1970, to time travel back there, man. Uh, and that's like a question that gets posed to me. I'm sure it gets posed to a lot of you. If you could go back in time, what Grateful Dead show would you like to see? Now, now right away, you think of stuff like 1977, you know, the, the Cornell, the English Town, some of the great shows from that year. Um, you know, Amsterdam, 81, they played that little bar with rented equipment and put on a hell of a show. Uh, that was Bob Weir's birthday, October 16th, 81. And of course, your 72 shows would be pretty cool to have been there for one of them. Um, the reason I might pick this Fillmore West, uh, gig is, you know, it's not the greatest show of all time, although it's pretty awesome. Uh, but f- for starters, just if you're going to go if you're going to go back in time, why not go back to the Fillmore West? Uh, Bill Graham took the place over, leased it in 1968. It was the Carousel Ballroom and had just a, a four year run kind of unparalleled in music history. The acts he brought into that place and paired, you know, just essential uh, building block of, uh, of music as we know it, man. That's so to go back in time. Seeing a show in the, in the Fillmore West would be would be kind of like an ideal thing, and just imagine seeing Miles Davis, the music he was playing at this time on LSD in the Fillmore West. I mean, obviously the Grateful Dead, you know what to expect, but man, people out in the, in the audience that night, Miles Davis had just come out with Bitches Brew, so I figured not too much of the audience was was hip to what he was doing, but he came out there and just played like crazy, just this wild electric improvisation and uh the the, the crowd must they, they dug it man at first they must not know what hit them but they, you know but hey if, if you're a grateful dead fan this is right up your alley uh miles davis bitches brew i mean M- miles did for jazz with bitches brew but what, what bob dylan did for rock and roll with highway 61 you know knocked down all the barriers made everything possible and just expanded the world of music and that that's another cool reason why why I'd want to go back to to the Fillmore West this show because of where where Miles was at the time and where the Grateful Dead were they had already expanded the boundaries of if you want to call them a rock band you know they took it as far as you could already you know with um the acid tests and all the improvisation they were putting into the music and now they were transitioning into more of a song based you know they were about to come out with Working Man's Dead and American Beauty 
So um, they were kind of saying goodbye to some of their longer, more improvisational songs and, and moving into, you know, the songs that would define who the Grateful Dead were, you know, the songs of American Beauty, the songs of Working Man's Dead, which would both come out in 1970. And what a year 1970 was for Robert Hunter, the uh, uh, lyricist, bard, extraordinaire of the Grateful Dead. You know, and on May 24th, about, uh, I don't know if it was May 24th exactly, but it was when he was in England in May of 1970, a month after this show, in one afternoon, he wrote Ripple, Broke Down Palace, and To Lay Me Down, one afternoon. That, 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 would, that just kind of exemplifies the type of year Hunter had as, as a songwriter. Uh, so uh, just a, a, another thing about, about the Fillmore West, I was flipping through uh, the acts that were playing there. What Bill Graham did there was extraordinary, the way he paired acts. Uh, just some of the ones that, that kind of stood out for me over the years. I mean, you, you know, you got Pink Floyd play there, The Who. I, I mean, everybody was there. But here's a couple of, of pairings that were just incredible. I, would, just, I, I can't even imagine being there. Uh, you know, the, the pairing of established legendary acts uh, with up-and-coming ap- acts. So you had one night you had Electric Flag, Buddy Guy, and Freddie King. Sly Stone and Jeff Beck on another night. The Grateful Dead were through Albert Collins one night. Albert King and Credence Clearwater played together. Big Brother Holding Company, Santana, and Chicago. How's that for a triple billing? The Grateful Dead, One Night Played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, you had a pairing of Chuck Berry and Jethro Tull. Uh, Janis Joplin and Santana. Uh, one Night Led Zeppelin played with Isaac Hayes. And when I say played with, they played separate shows, but uh, they were on the same bill. B.B. Uh, King, Buddy Guy, Allman Brothers. And that's one to go back in time for, for sure. Joe Cocker, Van Morrison. Uh, You had a John Mayle, Elvin Bishop, and Herbie Hancock. Van Morrison and the Isley Brothers. I I mean, I could go on and on with this, but I think think you get the idea of how just unique and uh, legendary these pairings are. Uh, So Miles stretching the boundaries of musical improvisation and Dead had already been there, and they're kind of bringing him back to a more... America, Americana kind of sound as uh, uh, exemplified by the band on music from Big Pink. Um, so, hey, let's jump right into this Grateful Dead show on April 12, 1970. Man, it's a beauty. And, and the 1970 shows, man, they, they were just kind of all over the place. Most years, the Grateful Dead got into a certain flow. They would do certain songs and certain sets. 1970 with all the new songs working their way into the rotation, anything could happen at any time. Uh, on this night, they open up with uh, Good Morning, Little Schoolgirl, a 17-minute 17 17 version, uh, and Pigpen singing great, and just Jerry and, and, and Pig trading leads on this. Um, inc- incredible version of Good, Good Morning, Little Schoolgirl to kick it off. And let's check out a little bit of uh, Jerry and Pigpen exchanging uh, leads on this instrumental. Thank you. 
Good morning, little schoolgirl. Old school Grateful Dead from their debut album. And um, a song first recorded by Sonny Boy Williamson back in 1937. So the uh, Grateful Dead were in that period of transition on April 12, 1970. And songs like Good Morning, Little School Girl, they would soon stop playing, even though they brought it back many years later, uh, 1987, and then some versions in the later 90s. Uh, but so many classic songs with long jams uh, kind of saw their final final run in 1970. And we'll get to a few more of those songs as we go along here. And they were replaced by these new gems uh, from the pen of Robert Hunter. Uh, the first one on this night, Casey Jones on the heels of Good Morning Little Schoolgirl. A nice energetic uh, version of Casey Jones. A song which, unless people were following the Grateful Dead around and seen them uh, a bunch of times in 1970, it was probably a song nobody knew because Working Man's Dead had still not been released. Uh, so uh, this was the first of the new songs on this night, and it had an instant instant kind of appeal, man. This is Casey Jones' song that could grab you right away. Uh, so from Casey Jones, um, they go to Mama Tribe, little Merle Haggard. Uh, so you could right away get this whole Americana feel uh, dripping into the set here. Um, and then they go back to... Uh, the Psychedelics of 69 with uh, China Cat uh, and the new edition of China Cat, I Know You Rider. Cool thing about this version is just the raw, raw energy. It's, um, you know, China Cat Rider became, for, for the better, a, pol a more polished um, combination. Uh, it's like by the time Europe 72 came along. But uh, just listening to these, these versions from 1970, this one right here. Just raw energy, you know, a different sound from Garcia's guitar. And, but you could tell this was a, b a big song, Headed Places. And here comes the, a little bit of controversy as to what actually happened. Um, dead bass, and pretty much everywhere you see it's, it says Cat Rider into High Time, even though High Time doesn't exist on any of the tapes. Um, supposedly you could hear them going into high time, which I didn't hear when I was listening to the tape, unless there's an eyewitness that said they played high time. I, I would, ha I would have to assume that they, they, they didn't play it. Um, so it's, it's cat rider, possibly high time, uh, but not important because we don't have a rec any recording of it. Uh, the next thing we get is good love and right from the start. Uh, tape starts in with you know good loving right from the beginning, and this is just a, a tremendous version of good loving. By by the way, here's a fact: I was I was looking at some stats um, as I was researching the podcast. <laughs> podcast research, gotta love it. Um, good loving, the number, the most played song of 1970. Definitely that that kind of surprised me. Um, it even beat me and my uncle by by one one play. It was 67 to 66. Uh, in, in 1970, so good love and the most played song of the year, but wow, this is a, a tremendous version. You know, Pigpen singing excellent, the band rolls straight ahead, and then they go for a little Billy Mickey uh, drum break. These drums were really exciting in 1970. They, they, I mean, Mickey uh, left the band in 1970 for a little while. But the, the, some of these drum drum solos, like especially when they take the drum break, break and good love and uh, very hot, great uh, great work by them. And then out of drums, Jerry just you know the the band comes back and Jerry is just shredding. This is this is just such an awesome version, you know. The, just and right back, not much. There's no rapping on this. Just a, a concise, tight version. Concise, tight. Probably means ten minutes, but uh, it's just you know it's, it's an all really awesome, you know, just charged up version of of good loving uh, on the heels of Cat Rider. The set's rolling along, awesome here, and then uh, the the dead kind of break for. There's no acoustic uh, set on this night. The other nights at the Fillmore West during this run, there were acoustic sets. There were a lot of acoustic sets in in 1970. But not on this night, it's all electric. But the songs they play here, 
uh, on the heels of Good Love and or what they would have done in an acoustic set if they had their acoustic equipment. I have no idea what the story behind that was, but so they kind of do an acoustic set in, in the electric format here. Uh, the first they do Candyman, beautiful version of Candyman, uh, you know, kind of a, a good-natured riff on the Sammy Davis song, which was a hit at the time, and just another another great set of lyrics, Total Americana from Hunter, and then um, then you got Deep Ellum Blues following that, and just the, the way the like the Grateful Dead reincarnated Deep Ellum Blues when they came back and they did Reckoning in 1980, and, and then it became like a staple for Garcia, it just one of the uh, one of the most beloved acoustic tunes, but this version here, man, it's just like a, it's a different swing to it, a different feel. Um, I, as I was I listened to this. Um, April twelfth show maybe in the prior week couple weeks maybe five times and I was kind of really struck by how how powerful the Deep Ellum Blues is here so definitely a, a different feel than the nineteen eighty versions both are awesome but there's just like this funky kind of swing to it very cool on the heels of that we go right into Cumberland Blues and um, you know Garcia's cooking on it. Uh, but it's weird. This set definitely has like an, an acoustic feel, like almost like it was meant to be played acoustic. But they're playing, you know, obviously they're playing electric uh, instruments, and the Cumberland Blues consequently has a great little jams in it. And um, six hundred pounds of sin, the Dire Wolf uh, finishes off this uh, this portion of the set. Awesome work from uh, from from the band all the way through here on these four tunes. And just right here, you just get this kind of... 1970 has such a unique flow, like anything could break off at any time. And there's almost at times not even a flow, but it didn't matter because the band was hot. It's like they didn't even need to build up momentum. They could just switch from fast pace to kind of acoustic sounding songs and just they made it all work. And they were trying to, on the fly, they were trying to figure out how we're going to move forward. So now we we almost feels like a different part of the set coming up here, but they they kick off the next portion with dancing in the streets, and this is the legendary version, the one on Fallout from the Phil Zone, um, arguably the greatest version ever. In my book, uh, Deadology Volume Two, uh, the evolution of thirty three Grateful Dead jam anthems, dancing in the streets is one of those uh, songs that I picked out just because it's. You know, another another th- amazing thing about the Grateful Dead here, the songs that they would jam in and dancing in the streets. Um, you know, Martha Vandella's, Martha and the Vandellas song, you know, like a little Motown hit just became this incredible instrumental for them. And it remained that like in different reincarnations through the years. Uh, this version, I think, is like my would be my second favorite ever, even though it's completely ridiculous and all, off the hook. Uh, there's one from St. Louis, 1977, where they re- reimagined the song as more of like a, a funky, more polished version. Uh, that one from St. Louis is just insane. I give that a slight nod over this one. A couple other great versions to point out. Binghamton from 1970. Yeah, obviously, the Cornell, you know, pretty famous dancing in the streets. Um you know, 77 was it was an excellent year, 76, 77, those, uh, where they kind of did that sly in the stone, funky, funky uh, kind of ending before they're doing the final sing-off, uh, just great versions. 1979 has some smoking versions, in particular Buffalo. Buffalo, November 9th, 79, but let's get back to the Fillmore West. And just the way, I love Weir singing on this and the way the band takes off here, uh, just uh, mind-boggling, so enjoy. Dancing. 
of smoking beyond words, man. And then as, as the jam rolls along there, they go into um, one of their thematic jams, Tighten Up, um, a song made famous by Archie Bell and the Drells. Uh, weird thing, the other day, it had to be signs from beyond with this podcast. I'm listening to Smoky Soul Town. Uh, one of my favorite uh, stations that I listen to a lot on Sirius XM, and they played the Tighten Up. Uh, they played Tighten Up by Archie Bell, and following it was Dancing in the Streets, Martha and the Vandellas. I couldn't believe it, so I got uh, this combination in reverse. <laughs> signs, signs from beyond, man. Uh, yeah, but that that Tighten Up jam that that they that they do is great. So Tighten Up, feeling groovy, these little jams they threw in, uh, the songs like. But you see, that's that's what made Dancing in the Streets a major song. They gave it the same treatment that they gave Dark Star and the other one by introducing thematic jams into it. And yeah, Tighten Up definitely worked with Dancing in the Streets for sure. And uh, so the Fillmore West is blown away by this uh, Dancing in the Streets. Must have been incredible to be there. And then uh, just the strangeness of 1970. They follow up Dancing in the Streets with a beautiful Black Peter. <laughs> it's, it's just a weird, weird thing to go from the most exciting, fired-up thing to the complete dirge-like calm of Black Peter. And once again, it's a new song, so nobody really knows it. So just you know, so, just so unusual the way, the way they rolled forward with these, these 1970s uh, set lists. But um, hey, it's a great sound of Black Peter, man. I'm listening to this tape, and I'm loving it. Uh, so Black Peter, and then uh, another one from uh, Working Man's Dead, the big one, Uncle John's Band. Uh, w- once again, the, the, the crowd is out there. They, outside of possibly seeing the dead uh, within the last month or two, they they don't know these songs, man. So it's just you know introducing these new great songs, and because they're playing an electric here, the, the this is actually this Uncle John's is extremely good for an early version. Um, you know, once again, this is one of the, one of those shows I, I went back and I'm listening to the, uh, to the recording of it. I'm like, I don't want to let go. I kept going back and listening to it again and again. Uh, really very unusual. Um, you'll hear nothing like it in any other year. Uh, so we're getting close to the end here. One more big, big tune, uh, to close the night out. Viola Lee Blues. Going back, they started with the with a song from their first album, a major song, and now their first really major jam song, uh, Viola Lee Blues, to close out. And I, I was definitely taken back by how hot this one is. Uh, once again, in my Deadology Volume Two book, uh, Viola Lee Blues is one of the thirty-three uh, jam anthems that I looked at. And I put I put in seven, maybe six seven different versions of Viola Lee, and I omitted this one. Uh, probably a, you know well, I wouldn't call it a mistake because the other ones are pretty hot too. Most of the other ones are longer. This one's I think comes in about sixteen minutes. But wow, the way the way they finished this off at the end, just uh, mind boggling. Uh, so yeah, this was the end of the line for many of these great songs. You know the. Uh, uh, Viola Lee, Good Morning Little School Girl, uh, you know, even Dancing in the Streets, did, you know, it, it came back in, in 76, 77, that didn't last too long. They had definitely a huge changing in guard going from the Black Peter and Uncle John's uh, to, you know, discarding some of the, oh, <laughs> by the way, my mistake, I, before Viola Lee Blues, they played It's a, a Man's World, um, you know the the song made famous by James Brown, and and that that is the ultimate version, uh, the James James Brown, and I, I give the Grateful Dead uh, major props for for trying to do it's a man's world, and they they did a pretty good version. Pigpen sings his ass off. It's I mean he he's incredible on this, and the band does a, a good a good arrangement, you know. But how in the world do you take it's a man's world and make something incredible out of it. And I think that's what the Grateful Dead had to wrestle with, with uh, It's a Man's World, because they only played it, I think they played it 11 times in 1970. It's a little note I jotted down. I'm not sure if it's accurate. But they only played it in 1970, which I think 
kind of uh, kind of they, they they knew that it was too tough of a song to really develop. Not like Hard to Handle or Good Lovin' or many of the Big Ben songs they did. Uh, Midnight Hour where they could just kill it. And, you know, it, it was obviously great. This was a tough one to do, but, you know, they, they did a respectable job. And Pig Pen singing is, is awesome here. So that actually was the song before Viola Lee Blues. And, man, do they they bring the house down at this the end of this Viola Lee. So uh, let's check that out. To feedback, followed by an "And We Bid You Good Night" encore uh, to close out an, an eclectic show at the Fillmore West. Uh, the final final performance of Miles Davis and the Grateful Dead of a four night run, uh, memorable. Must have been a truly amazing experience uh, to be there. And it was Bill Graham who set this up. Uh, Miles Davis. Um, after he came out with Bitches Brew, was looking to play, you know, in, in bigger, bigger venues. He got tired of the jazz club, nightclub thing. You don't get paid as much, you know, all kinds of shady stuff going on. Uh, so he had the, uh, the courage and the vision to bring jazz, to bring his jazz into, into bigger arenas and new markets, as he did here. 
And at the time, um, you know, brilliant job by Bill Graham pairing him with the Grateful Dead. That was uh, uh, incredible. Bill really had, you know, a, 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 besides being a great promoter, he really did have a musical mind of putting together the right acts in, the, in that place. It was, it was amazing what he did. Uh, so at the time, uh, Miles Davis, he came out with my favorite album before Bitches Brew in a silent way. And to many, that's kind of like the birth, the start of um, what would become the fusion uh, movement in jazz, uh, especially with the composition in a silent way. Um, You know, and John McLaughlin played on that album. You know, he brought some electric guitar in, uh, just really a um, a hypnotic, uh, intense sound on that album. And with Bitches Brew, he took it a step further. Um, at, at this time, uh, Miles, in his autobiography, cited three influences, uh, three big influences on him. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, James Brown, and Sly Stone. I mean, uh, th- those three influenced uh, so much, you know, from the, the culture, the way he was dressing, um, you know, but the, the funk, the rock and roll, um, what James Brown was doing, man, so... Uh, Miles was, he was, you know, as a jazz guy, he was able to pick up on that. I mean, you, you look at the other jazz people at the time, you know, um, you know, whether it's wh- whoever, you know, whether it, you know, or any, any jazz figures through history, that they really never, they stayed within their, within their boundaries. It was just Miles had this incredible vision and courage uh, to see what was happening and to see what the next step was. And, you know, kind of like Bob Dylan, he didn't care what the consequences were. He just went for it. And, um, yeah, we're all glad he did. And that Bitches Brew, man, just a wild electric album. And it's even kind of crazier hearing that stuff uh, live in concert. Uh, I could only imagine having that ability to time travel, go back, and um, just, you know, drop some acid. Hey, it's 1970. If you could time travel, you might as well drop some acid. And just hearing... Miles come out, and uh, the music is just so intense. It's like 75 straight minutes of uh, just, it's it's kind of scripted, but it sounds totally unscripted, and it's just brilliant playing. In his band at the time, um, you had the Miles Davis Quintet with Ayrto Marrera on percussion. Uh, so the, the Miles Quintet con- consisted of Steve Roseman on sax, Dave Holland on bass, Jack DeJanet on drums, and Chick Corea on the Fender, the electric Fender Rhodes. And man, Chick Corea is one is one of the dominant players. Um, I mean, it just his sound kind of defines this the the Black Beauty, the album that came out on April tenth. Such standout playing. And at first, Chick was uh, resistant to wanting to play the Fender Rhodes, but Miles kind of <laughs> forced him into it. Miles. You know, could he was the type of guy, you know, you came into the studio, he asked you to do something, you were doing it, man. He just, you, you had to trust his vision. And obviously, Chick Corea came to love it, and he's probably best known for playing the uh, Fender Rhodes. Uh, so, hey, one other thing, and I know I've mentioned this on, on a podcast before, um, but I'm going to once again throw out my little brush with, uh, with some famous musicians here, Jack DeJanet and Dave Holland. These guys, my father was their accountant, and they actually used to come to my house. I think the years were about 1975 through 78, 79. Um, I was 13, 14, 15. At, at one point, they may have came over, and I might have just gotten to the Grateful Dead. They used to sign albums for me. I had no idea who the hell they were or that they had played on a Miles Davis album. I remember my, my father telling me that these guys were big in Europe, and, and my, my father didn't even really know who they were. He was just, yeah, you know, he was their accountant. He was a good guy. That, that's probably why all these jazz, jazz people came over our, our house to get their taxes done. Um, two other guys, Larry Coriel and um, John Abercrombie, also used to come over our house and get their taxes done. These guys would sign albums for me, and I talked to them, and I, I look at the way they dressed. I'm like, damn, these guys are cool. But I never, never was able to, you know, dig the music because I'm, you know, at the age I'm in, I, you know, just getting into jazz at that point is a little difficult. And my, it's like my father wasn't into, really into music either. He's not sitting in the living room listening to Bitches Brew. I don't even think he knew who Miles Davis was. So just a crazy thing. Like I still see, 
Dijonette and Holland these days. I go I go to their concerts. They remember my dad. They're always you know happy to talk to me and stuff. So a uh, pretty cool thing. Um, you know, having that little thing with Jack Dijonette and Dave Holland. Uh, so April tenth, nineteen seventy. Uh, Miles Band, you know, they take the stage, they blow away the crowd. And I guess it's best to put it in uh, the words of Miles from his autobiography when he comes to discussing uh, the Grateful Dead crowd on that night and what it was like to play in front of all these uh, hippies. Uh, so from the autobiography, Miles said, The place was packed with these real spacey, high, white people. And when we first started playing, People were walking around and talking, but after a while, they all got quiet and really into the music. I played a little something like from Sketches of Spain and then went into the Bitches Brew shit, and that really blew them out. After that concert, every time I would play out there in San Francisco, a lot of young white people showed up at the gigs. So it sounds like Miles Davis dug the Grateful Dead crowd. Um, noticed that they were enjoying the uh, music, and hey, it's kind of like a Europe 72 dark star. That's probably the closest thing I could compare that the Grateful Dead did. Uh, it kind of sounded like M- what Miles was doing at, at the time. Just the, the music was like that intense, and you just hear Dave Holland on bass and Chick Corea, and uh, you know what Miles is doing. Steve Grossman was pretty good. He was probably... Uh, not the most smooth, fluid jazz player, but it, it definitely worked within the setting, what he was doing. Uh, so uh, incredible band Miles put together. And, um, and another cool thing that he mentions is autobiography. He talks about meeting Jerry Garcia. And he said, me and Jerry hit it off, you know, and they were talking about jazz and he liked Garcia a lot. Now that's huge. I, I was like stopped in my tracks when I heard that because Miles had very few kind things to say and if he did he usually had a double-edged sword to it you know like with Bill Graham who seemed to have a combative relationship with everybody but man he had the the best thing to you know the one paragraph he just you know talked about how much he liked Jerry and you know that that was Jerry Garcia for you man it's uh, that's why we love him he just had this coolness that even other great musicians uh Miles Davis Bob Dylan loved Jerry Garcia you know, just guys who are, are tough to reach and, you know, legendary guys who, you know, were, were definitely put up uh, protective walls, man. They would meet Jerry and they would just be right at home with him. So he, Garcia had that magical just connection, connection to people with music and just connection as a human being. Uh, so April 10th, 70 starts off with a song Directions. Uh, and, and Directions was kind of like the tag that Miles used on it to describe his music as he's putting out these albums directions from miles davis you know he knew he was taking music in a new direction he wasn't afraid to take credit for it man miles was something else another interesting thing from the autobiography you know he's he's beating up all these people and he's talking about you know being at the the fillmore west and how he disliked he called steve miller a sorry ass cat you know so um you know so his his uh praise for jerry garcia was was the opposite of what he was dishing out to most people in his book. Um, so, yeah, I, I can never forget that, that that he just, you know, just totally ripped Steve Miller in this. Not personally, he just didn't think he was that great of a player, and he didn't enjoy having to open for him. Uh, so, carrying on with this uh, Miles show, Miles runs down the voodoo is next. That's from Bitches Brew. Uh, then he goes does a song, Willie Nelson. Um, this is from the Jack ja- Johnson outtakes. Jack Johnson would be the the album that followed Bitches Brew. A great, great album, man. 45 minutes. Um, different from Bitches Brew. It's electric, but it's more like stripped down. And um, it definitely has that boxing feel, you know, like you, it's something you could go to the gym and, you know, hit the, hit the speed bag or, or the heavy bag during that. It's um, uh, definitely. So th- those are my three favorite Miles albums. Um, you know, it kind of blues like a different thing and all, all the great ones he's done. But just that one period where he put together In a Silent Way, Bitches Brew, and Jack Johnson, a tribute to Jack Johnson. Um, so the, the Willie Nelson song is definitely, it's a, it sounds like something on Jack Johnson. So what they did with Black Beauty, it came out. And at first it was just called Black Beauty, side one, Black Beauty one, side two, Black Beauty two. 
and I don't think Miles had anything to do with that. Um, you know, so they were, and then when they reissued it, that was a, a Japan release. When they reissued it in the United States, I think it was 1997, they had to give all the songs titles. So I'm not sure about the accuracy of all this, but um, uh, so you got, it's about, it's about that time. That's one of the cool little jams from In a Silent Way. Um, and just listening to Holland play on this and Miles, just incredible. Uh, just a fa fast paced, you know, really exciting music. But also it has like that taste where you got some space. Uh, kind of, you know, Miles and Garcia had that same, you know, um, just ability to silence. Not playing something often was louder than, you know, just constantly playing. And kind of Miles and Garcia were on the same, uh, uh, save, same wave pattern with that. And moving on, you got Bitches Brew, Spanish Key. Uh, so ba basically, whatever the songs are called here, this is 75 minutes of a combination of In a Silent Away, Bitches Brew, and a tribute to Jack Johnson. And it's all so fast-paced. And it's almost like, besides Miles' great playing, it's like Chick Corea is the star of this, man. Just that Fender Rhodes Man, if you love the sound of the Fender Rhodes, you you got to get Black Beauty. There's nothing like this. And Miles came out with uh, a lot of great albums from this time period, live albums, studio albums. But yeah, the, the, he's, he was like the Grateful Dead. He'd go out there, play. It's an album, just like, you know, like the Grateful Dead, even though they didn't put them out as albums. And now they're being put out as albums. But um, you go out there, it's a fresh canvas, boom. Uh, so a lot, a lot of uh, interesting parallels between Miles Davis and the Grateful Dead, and thanks to Bill Graham for getting those guys together for an unforgettable night uh, in the history of music, in the history of the Fillmore West. Uh, so that wraps up episode 17, season 2 of the Deadology podcast. I'm your host, Howard Weiner. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. My website, Tangled Up in Tunes. Uh, my books are on Amazon including the one I mentioned uh, for a couple of tunes here, Deadology Volume 2. Um, I'm going to bring my friend Doug Schmel back next week. We're going to talk about the incredible, on the anniversary date, or at least close to the anniversary date, we're going to talk about the incredible Rotterdam uh, show from Europe 72, uh, May 11th, 72. And I can't wait to dig into that one again. That's definitely one of the all-time great shows right up there with Bickershaw. Um, for May 7th, a couple days earlier. Hey, but once again, thanks for listening. Peace out.